Hello everyone, we're back for another Live at Five. I am your curator, Kevin Adkison, and it is a rainy day here in Bloomfield Hills, and so I'm back inside of Sarnen House, and I wanted to today do a deep dive into one of our favorite weavings, um, but not a weaving by Loya Sarnen. This one is by Greta Skotster, who is another Finnish weaver. And I am indebted to two people uh, for most of my knowledge about this tapestry. One is Lena Svinfund, um, who is a Finnish scholar who's writing about uh, uh, Loya Saarinen right now. And she published a book in Finnish about Greta last year. So while I can't read the book, I can look at the pictures. And I'm also indebted to my colleague, Lynette Mayman, who wrote a wonderful blog about Greta last year. And you can learn a little bit more about uh, her and see other photos on the blog. Um, I am in the Sarnen House dining room, which if this is your first time for a Live at Five, um, welcome to the tour series. I do these tours every Tuesday and Thursday, and I come from different parts of Cranbrook's campus. Sarnen House is my home base. Um, it was restored to its 1930 appearance in 1994, and it's been opened as a public museum ever since then. And in the Sarnen dining room, this is where Aliel and Loya Sarnen would entertain. This is where they um, would sort of woo clients for their different projects that they had going on. It's also where they would welcome new students and scholars. Um, so the table has quite a bit of history. The table is to Aliel Sarnen's own design, uh, and it expands to seat up to 14 people at the table. And people who have enjoyed dinner here at the dining room uh, include Frank Lloyd Wright, who was a regular guest and friend of the Sarnens, Le Corbusier, who only came to America one time, uh, and he stopped by Cranbrook and visited with the Sarnens, Walter Gropius, Joseph Hudnut, Paul-Philippe Cray, uh, Joseph and Annie Albers. It was a real who's who that was coming through uh, Cranbrook. And so when they were here in the dining room, they were not only learning about this community of artisans, they were seeing Sarnen's buildings. And then when they were sitting here underneath the golden dome uh, with the rays of gold light, uh, they were surrounded by this sort of total work of design, total work of art, eating off of plates that Mrs. Sarnen selected for the family, using silverware that Aliel Sarnen designed for this room, drinking out of um, glasses that were from Sweden. And there's very few objects that are actually in this room. There's not a lot of art objects. And so most of the design is coming from uh, the furniture with its Hollywood and ebony inlay and the fur chairs. It's coming from the rug that was actually machine woven in Philadelphia at the Wilton, uh, Wilton Weave studio. Um, it's coming from the wood paneling that is also fur. And then there are these niches. And sometimes Mrs. Sarnen would have flowers in the niches. Those are antique Finnish um, coffee, pot, uh, coffee and chocolate pots. Other times uh, she had pieces in the niches that included things that Aliel Sarnen himself designed, like this centerpiece here um, from about 1931 that is brass went with the whole golden room. But there are only actually two works of art hanging on the walls. Um, those of you who have been friends of the center long enough to have attended one of our paid events, hopefully got a uh, New Year's card this uh, winter that showed these lovers in the snow or the crane and heron. This is a modern reproduction, but the Sarnens had the original Japanese woodblock print. And Japanese prints were very fashionable in the Art Deco period in the 1930s. 
So it fit with the whole aesthetic and the sort of Chinese red niches, the uh, overtones of Egyptian revival, lots of different uh, sources, world sources being brought into the room. But for our tour today, notice the size of this work of art. It is a small rectangle, smaller than an individual panel. It's placed asymmetrically next to the pantry. I'll close this door so we can get a sense of the whole wall. Uh, and Sarnen, he always uses these irregular uh, asymmetries throughout the campus design, but this one is especially pronounced, that the, there's only a Japanese print on one side of the wall. Sarnen said, uh, he told a reporter once, uh, to paint a picture is to make art, to hang a picture is to make architecture. And so he viewed the placement of artwork in the house as part of his overall architectural scheme. It wasn't just um, that he was an interior decorator or that the interiors were somehow removed from the architecture. It was all one part. The architects concerned uh, with the table setting, with the table itself, with the chair, the rug, what's on the wall, the wall paneling, the building, the city, uh, the entire world. And so in this room, Sarnen just hangs two things, the little Japanese print, uh, and then the massive tapestry by Greta Skotsker. And those of you who have come on a tour of Cranbrook from about 1994 until 2019, I have an apology to make you for a very, up uh, to make to you for a very long time. We said that this tapestry was woven for this room in Finland by Greta Skotsker, and that is not true. Um, this piece was actually woven serially and was retailed. So there are three known copies of this tapestry. And Greta Skotsker is a very interesting character. That is her uh, maiden name. She became Greta Skotsker Leighton, Leighton, um, after she married her husband. She was born in 1900. She died in 1994. So she died the house, the year the house opened as a museum. Uh, the art museum attempted to contact her in the 80s and 90s and never received a reply that's in the archives. Um, oh, we only have the letters that were sent to her. She studied art uh, at the School of ha Arts and Crafts in Helsinki. And then she began working in different handicrafts, dyeing textiles, block printed cottons, as well as weaving. And she really became a major weaving enterprise about 1937, when she had a studio set up in um, near Vipuri, Finland, which is now after World War II as part of Russia. So where her studio was located when this was woven, um, became part of Russia after World War II. And what's interesting about the weave structure here, the overall scene is depicting a tree sort of growing up and expanding, and then five birds flitting across. There are the sort of branches that are growing across. There's the vines going up. You can actually see it better through the lens of the camera phone than you can in real life. The colors are are more vivid here. Uh, and what's interesting about the construction is that you might want to call this a tapestry. And it is a type of tapestry, but if you are French or Belgian, uh, you would not call this a tapestry. This is not uh, what we might call a Goblin's tapestry or a French tapestry. These are essentially inlaid fibers overwoven. And so if you know much about weaving, uh, this piece was woven where this is our warp. These are the long fibers that are ready um, on the loom. And then when you're sitting at the loom, you're weaving this direction. So you weave across and then you come back and you weave the next direction. And this here is the, the sort of base weave What's interesting about uh, this Hatterbottenswanner technique, the HV technique, named after the Swedish school of arts and crafts that invented it, is that the design is discontinuous. So these 
these wefts that are running across here, if you see that line, that's going to run across the entire tapestry. That is what is making the cloth and what is keeping this as a single piece. And so there are some strings that go back and forth across the whole tapestry. And if this was a true uh, goblin style tapestry, the design would also be tied together, weaving back and forth all the way across. But what Skotsker was doing uh, in her weaver, she herself was a upper middle class uh, sort of managing the company. So it's unlikely that she was involved at all in the actual weaving production. But her Finnish weavers are taking individual strings. And do you see where that orange string starts there? It weaves across and then it turns back. And it's almost like embroidery, but she is doing it at the loom. Uh, and so these pieces are made uh, where I could actually, if I was... Um, a real sick person, I could go in and I could unweave all of these blue strings and I could just remove the entire bird, but there would still be these open weave sections. I would not be uh, uh, removing the textile itself. On a historic French tapestry, you can't do that. If you remove the face of the, the angel, you would have a hole in the tapestry. So these overweaven, overwoven, overshot textiles, um, it's a quicker way of weaving. It's also much less strong structurally, because if you think about it, most of this design is non-structural. It's being supported by that weft that goes all the way across. And then the design is just inlaid on top of it. Still at the loom, so it's not embroidered after the weaving. It's done all at once. You're making the cloth and making the design. But it is a very quick way of working, if there's anything quick about textile weaving. And it's also a very structurally unstable way of weaving. What's interesting is about um, this piece that you don't see in many textiles are these open weave sections where you can see uh, that you can actually look through the entire weaving. This is the same technique, the Hattabattensvaner technique, is what Loya Saarinen used uh, in her monumental weavings at Cranbrook. Uh, of course, she was using the Hattabattensvaner technique because all of her weavers were trained at the Hattabattensvaner. The materials of this tapestry are quite interesting. Most of it is um, wool, and but then there are also colors that are cotton, and then there are threads that are linen. And then if we can find them, there's a section. Do you see that shiny section? Uh, in a historic tapestry, that might be silver or gold, but here it's rayon. And so rayon is a cotton product. It's not a, it's not a plastic, uh, but it is a 20th century way of processing cotton in order to get this more uh, durable and high shine material. Now, each of the birds have little moments of rayon. They're not quite getting picked up in the camera phone, um, but it does have this sort of glimmer as, it, as you move across the tapestry in the room. And so thinking of having dinner at this table, uh, you're underneath this bronze light, which has these bronze peacocks that are catching, uh, uh, holding the, the light fixture. And then Sarnin uses these bronze rods that are going up to the ceiling. And these are solid rods. These are not beads. Um, this entire rod was turned on a lathe in order to get this design going up. But I love the way that the light bulbs sort of shoot out and then create this staccato rhythm moving up where it has this very beaded decorative way of capturing the light. And then it's reflected off of the 23 karat gold dome up above. Mrs. Sarnen hated the low quality of flowers that she could get in Michigan winters. And so she bought this little bird at the Wiener Werkstatt in Vienna in 1932, and then had the Cranbrook silversmith cut the base of it down uh, so it would fit perfectly on the inlay. And so he is catching the light up above, the light fixture itself is glowing, the whole room is glowing, and then you have the rayon through the tapestry that has the similar glint. The Sarnins 
did have candlesticks. I don't know how often they ate by candlelight, um, but it, what a magical place to be in in the evening when everything is sort of aglow and shimmering. And Mrs. Sarnen uh, famously would serve pineapple upside down cake for dinner. So you would be sitting at the round table with this golden room, eating a round piece of golden pineapple with a red cherry in the center. Now, the Skotsker tapestry also serves as an artistic mirror of sorts. Um, I mentioned that Saarinen hated uh, pure symmetry. He also, um, he didn't hate it. I don't think he hated anything. He was a great guy, very gentle, very kind. Um, but he doesn't often give us pure symmetry. Um, and so he, he, as ways of sort of being asymmetrical, sometimes he uses artistic mirroring. So instead of having a dining room with windows on two sides, he gives us the woven window of Greta Skotsker, which shows us the trees um, uh, and the birds. And then on the other side of the dining room, we have a window which has a tree behind it. And the Sarnans did keep the, the shades closed. Um, you can see that in 25 years of a house museum, the red dye has caused, has reacted with UV light and has disappeared. So the, the fabric is actually, actually missing there. Um, hopefully we will have these rewoven one day soon. These were hand woven in the basement of the house on the original loom. Um, but picture that this red grid is there and then you have the grid of the leaded glass windows behind it and you're creating this sort of grid of the view leading back to the tree which I assume has some birds in it and so there's this really beautiful sort of symmetry between the grid system that's um, a natural part of weaving uh, and sort of the, the creation of the the weave of the tapestry requires you to ha work in grids. And then you have Sarnin repeating that grid on his view out to the other side. The sculpture there is by Aino Altinen, Kiwi's muse. And notice that she is sitting uh, in this patio that has a octagon pattern. And you're looking through the window that creates these octagons. If you sort of uh, draw the corners in of these squares. Uh, and then the entire room itself is octagonal, and you're uh, sitting on a rug that has the octagonal design of the patio repeating. So all of these ways of relating uh, each element to the next largest whole and creating this real cohesive um, environment where the pattern of this rug is not the exact paving patterns of the uh, patio in the way that we might see it in the 1980s with the postmodernist. Uh, instead, it is a much more sophisticated sort of variation on a theme. It's like a Sibelius symphony where Sarnin takes these notes, the octagon, um, or the telescoping form, and he repeats them across all different materials, all different functions, and all different sizes. Uh, and together they form this very cohesive total work of art. Now, to bring it back to our dear friend Greta, um, after studying at the School of Arts and Crafts, um, she married her husband, I think Wilhelm uh, Leighton, uh, and Mr. Greta Skotsker, uh, was a, uh, in forestry school, and then he went off to the Yale School of Forestry, um, and he studied at Yale in the uh, late 1920s, right before Eero Saarinen went to Yale, uh, and then he went back to Finland and he worked for the Enso Company, uh, which was a pulp business made, made paper. Uh, and he modernized from all of their old imperial Russian equipment and brought in new American um, equipment and new ways of industrializing Finnish uh, paper. And of course, Finland, the great wooded country. He turns the company around. It becomes one of the largest companies in Finland before Nokia. Uh, and they build a headquarters designed by Alvar Alto with weavings in the lobby by Greta Skotsker. Uh, Greta's business flourishes alongside of her husband's business, um, and she begins doing uh, textiles for the retail trade. And in 1947, she was integral in opening fin Finland House, 
and selling finished decorative arts in Manhattan. And so she was actually one of the first people, if not the first persons to uh, import the decorative furniture and uh, glassware of Alvar and Aino Alto. And so she sold the Alto's wares in Finland House in 1947. And at the same time, she was selling her printed textiles. What's interesting is she may have been selling Pipson, Sarn, and Swanson's wares as well. Uh, again, I wish I spoke Finnish, um, but in the book, it really looks like there are some Pipson textiles for sale in her shop, and it would have totally been within the realm of possibilities. I wish I knew what the relationship was personally between Greta and the Sarnens. It is impossible for them not to have known each other. The president of Finland's most famous company who has invested in architecture, his wife having a weaving studio, would have known Finland's most famous architect and his quite famous wife who was a weaver. So even though this piece was not woven custom for the house, and there are three of them, uh, it is it fits perfectly in the room, perfectly alongside the wall. It is the wall, uh, coordinates with the color, and I think it, it speaks to this sort of global friendship of Finnish artisans working, designing, and selling here in America. What happened to the other two? Um, they were both in hospitals, and uh, Lena was unable to identify if those hospitals still had them. Um, and so ours may be the only ver version of this tapestry left. Uh, what's fun about knowing that it was serially produced, we have the original drawings now uh, are in an archive in Finland. And previously, Cranbrook did not know that those drawings survived. Um, if anyone has any other questions, you can always message them to me. Um, I'll be back next Tuesday with another Live at Five. Um, next week, we'll be doing a closer look at some of the books in Cranbrook Academy of Arts Library. Uh, on Wednesday, I'll be coming live on Facebook from Cranbrook House. We'll be doing a tour of Cranbrook House. Uh, and you never know where I'm going to pop up next. If it's raining, it'll likely be here at Sarnen House. I hope everyone is doing well. I hope that you're enjoying these Live at Five tours and that you're learning new things, um, being safe, staying at home. It is that time of the year where like PBS or NPR, it's uh, your time to be able to support the Cranbrook mission. And so we are looking um, towards you if you are enjoying these Live at Five tours, if you're enjoying learning more about Cranbrook. Uh, from me, Kevin Atkinson, your curator, I would so appreciate it if you went online to our website. Um, it's on the profile, onto our support tab, and gave us anything that you're able to to help support the Cranbrook mission of preserving and sharing these stories and uh, making sure that this remarkable place continues to inspire, uh, it continues to inform and to be here because I need to reweave those curtains uh, and I can't teach myself how to weave, you know, without your continued support. Uh, no, if you want to know more about what your donations are supporting, um, I'm happy to talk more. Send me an email, send me a message, and I'll see you next Tuesday for another Live at Five. I hope that you enjoyed this close look at one of my favorite tapestries here at Cranbrook. Last story before I go, because it just, I just remembered it. Uh, once Lynette was giving a tour and this whole tapestry just detached, it, it gave up from its Velcro at the top and fell down on, in the middle of the tour. So it was recently re-sewn and reattached. I don't think that will happen, but make sure that you always check your nails and Velcro behind your paintings and tapestries. Have a good one, everybody. I'll see you next week.